Our second video from 5.3 and final video for chapter five is focused on one thing. Okay. It's a shorter video, but it's probably the biggest, most intense concept from chapter five, and that's the use of Hess's law. There are two ways to determine the heat involved in a chemical change, right? You can measure it in the lab using calorimetry. Right? Do the reaction, use calorimeter, see how much heat is produced or consumed. Right? But that's not always feasible to do all the time. Okay? So what Hess's law does for us is provide two ways that you can calculate the heat of a reaction from quantities that have already been, been determined experimentally for enthalpy values. Okay. So that's what the bottom, bottom point is telling us. For the reactions, the amount of heat involved must be calculated. When we have that situation, we use Hess's law. Two ways to do it. We'll look at both of them in turn. Okay. The first one takes advantage of the fact that enthalpy is a state function. Okay. So the first application of Hess's law says that instead of looking at the reaction as a whole, if I can write out that reaction as a bunch of steps, several stepwise processes, then the enthalpy change for the total process, the overall equation, is equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes of the individual steps. Okay? Because being a state function, it only depends on where we start and where we finish, not by how we got there. Right? So if I know the individual parts, I can just add them together. Okay? To illustrate that, we can think about carbon and oxygen coming together to form CO2, right? which has a delta H value of negative 394 kilojoules, it's exothermic. But the question is, what if I didn't know what delta H was? Well, C coming together with diatomic oxygen, O2, is not the only way to form CO2. I, I could think about first forming carbon monoxide, right? C and half an O2, so a single O. Forming carbon monoxide, and then that picking up another single oxygen to form CO2. And if you add all of those reactants and products together and simplify it, just like you would a net ionic equation from chapter four, you end up with the same net change that we saw from the previous slide, right? C plus O2 going to CO2. And sure enough, if you take those two individual parts right there and add them together, the sum is negative 394 kilojoules, which shows us that Hess's law works, right? The enthalpy change of an overall reaction is equal to the sum of the steps. You just have to add them together. It doesn't matter if it happens in one step or two steps or 10 steps. Okay. Shown graphically here, it could be in one step or two steps. You think about this like an elevator, right? If you take the elevator from the fifth floor down to the bottom floor, it's the same as taking it from the fifth floor, then it stops at the fourth floor, someone else gets on, and then you go down to the bottom floor. Okay? You still started and ended in the same place. Right? Think about it like a roller coaster. Right? You start and leave from the station. It doesn't matter how you got there. That's what Hess's law is telling us for enthalpy. We just have to remember that in order to solve for an equation, sometimes we have to manipulate are thermochemical equations. And remember the properties of thermochemical equations from 5.2. Okay? Tells us in the first part of 5.3 as well. Tells us that delta H, the enthalpy change, is directly proportional to the quantities of reactants or products. Okay? So if you're given a delta H value, it's for the reaction exactly as it's shown. If you change the equation by multiplying it by a certain factor or by flipping it around, you have to do the change, the same change to the enthalpy value. Okay? So if you double all of the coefficients, right, and you can't ever just change one coefficient, you have to change everything in a whole reaction. If you double all the coefficients, you have to double the enthalpy value. Right? And if something is endothermic one way, it's exothermic the other way. So you're allowed to flip a reaction around if you want, but then you have to flip the sign as well for the enthalpy value. If it was negative, going one way, if you flip the reaction, it's positive the other way. Okay. So this example 5.14 from the text is what a Hess's law problem looks like. Okay. You're asked to solve for the enthalpy change for 
aluminum and chlorine coming to together to form aluminum chloride, given their physical states. But you don't know the delta H value for that reaction. You have to solve for it using this toolbox down here. I, I strongly recommend you pause the video and try it. Manipulate these equations to make this one. Then add the enthalpy values together, accounting for any changes you made to the equations, and you can get a final answer, in this case, of negative 1,407 kilojoules. You can look for a separate video on Blackboard showing you how to solve this problem. That's the first application of Hess's law. What about the second? Yeah. Hess's law can also relate to enthalpies of formation. Yeah. If we're given the enthalpies of formation, delta HF, of the reactants and the products, then we can use the second application of Hess's law to solve for the enthalpy change for that reaction. Okay? Because effectively, what's happening in any chemical reaction, this is an oversimplification, right? but it's a thought process, is all of the reactants are breaking down into their individual elements. Okay? So then the enthalpy changes are opposite of the enthalpy of formation, because okay? they're breaking apart followed by those elements recombining okay, to form new products. So there we're just thinking about delta HF of the products, yep. which tells us that in a thought process, we'll see the equation on the next slide, what we're doing with Hess's law, breaking things down and then building them back up. So we have to just consider the sum of the enthalpy of, of formation of the products right, plus the sum of the negatives of the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. Okay, so the reactants are negative, the products stay positive as they are. And right, shown in a formula, delta H of the reaction is equal to the sum right, of the coefficients multiplied by the heat of formation of the products minus the sum of the coefficients multiplied by the heat of formation of the reactants. Okay, so you take all the products, find their delta HF value, multiply it by its coefficient from the balanced chemical equation, add together all the products, add together all the reactants, their values, and then it's products minus reactants. That minus sign right there accounts for the negative that we need from the previous slide. So this is what the problem would look like for the second application of Hess's law. Okay. Hess's law problems are always asking you to solve for the delta H of the reaction, but here we're given heats of formation. Okay, enthalpies of formation. Okay. So I have it for everything, NO2, right? H2O, HNO3, and NO. So I take those values, right? HNO3 and NO are my two products. NO doesn't have a coefficient, so it stays as 90.2. 207.4, negative 207.4, right? Gets multiplied by two, because I have a coefficient of two up here. Then I add those numbers together, that's everything for my products. And I do the same thing for my reactants, right? Positive 33.2 multiplied by three, negative 285.8 multiplied by one, add those two values together for my reactants, and then it's just products minus reactants. And that shows you right here how to do that. Final value of negative 138.4. Products minus reactants, just making sure you multiply by their respective coefficients. Now those enthalpies of formation always will be provided to you, okay? so don't worry about that. It's one of two applications of Hess's law. Either you're using delta HF, these enthalpies of formation, or you're manipulating equations. If you encounter a situation where you're asked to do a Hess's law problem like that, but the heat of formation isn't given to you, well, it has to be. Unless, keep in mind that the heat of formation of any element in its most standard state is zero, which we covered in an earlier video. Okay, so delta HF of O2 as a gas or sodium as a solid, those are zero. So it's a pretty safe assumption if one thing in the equation isn't given to you, just think to yourself, is it an element in its most standard state? Yes, okay, then that value is zero. We finish the chapter with a couple example problems. Here's another one asking you to use the first application of Hess's law on slide 99. Here's another one asking you to use the second application of Hess's law. Notice in this situation, there's no delta HF given to you for gaseous chlorine because that's an element in its most standard state. So the value is zero. 
You can find videos on Blackboard showing how both of these problems are solved. Definitely pause the videos and try them on your own first, okay? because these are going to definitely appear on your test. Hess's Law is one of the biggest ideas from Chapter 5, and the two applications are the key takeaways from this video.